uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us uh, a very prolific architect, planner, ecologist, as well as an author who is best known for his signature green architecture and master planning. Now, this is, in fact, differentiated from the other green architects by his authentic ecology-based approach, as well as in the distinctive green verdant aesthetic of his architecture and the performance beyond conventional green rating systems. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he's also authored over 12 books and monographs on ecological design. He's also the principal of Hamza and Yang with offices in Malaysia, UK, and China. Most importantly, he's also the recipient of the Malaysian Institute of Architects Gold Medal, the Government of Malaysia's Merdeka Award, the Prince Claus Award Netherlands, the Architectural Society of China Liang Shicheng Award 2016. He also holds the chair of the Distinguished Plime Professorship at the University of Illinois. In fact, the UK Guardian newspaper named him as one of the 50 individuals who could save the planet. He's also named by CNN as a leading architect in ecological design. Now, the credit list, in fact, goes way long to announce. But ladies and gentlemen, let's have a huge round of applause for none other than Dr. Ken Yang on the stage here. A huge, huge round of cheer, ladies and gentlemen. Morning. I'm going to talk about the work on eco architecture and eco master planning and the experiments that we've, experiments that we've been doing, um, a bit of theory and, and design examples. Now, the big question I keep constantly being asked is what is ecological design? Why ecological design? What's clear in the recent interplan, inter governmental um, report, climate change report, is that we only have 10 years left to do something urgently. Otherwise, um, it will be a catastrophic collapse of our ecosystem. I started life in our, before I started practice um, as an ecologist. An ecologist sees the planet as covered by this thin film called the biosphere. And within that biosphere, there are communities of plants and animals, and the biochemical cycles, the water cycle, the hydrological cycle, and so forth. Now, you can't just see the uh, biosphere as, as having units which are called ecosystems, and ecosystems can consist of communities of plants and animals, and uh, basically defined as biotic constituents, which is the organic constituents, and the abiotic, which is physical acting together to form a whole. Now, we as human beings are part of the body community, but we are the most powerful. We are one of the species in nature, we're the most dominant species, and we're able to change the biosphere. Now, we as one of the species in nature, we make things, we make artifacts. We make more artifacts than any other species in nature. Our goddess of built environment. But it is a combination of what we do and the production processes, the process of those environment, and the poor, ineffective biointegration between what we do and the biosphere and the ecosystems that is the cause of environmental degradation. And so my work has started to look at how can we address it by design. I saw ecological design as one of now, what is biointegration? I see what we do as architects and designers is very similar to what doctors and surgeons do um, in the design of prosthetic device. Now, a prosthetic device is artificial, synthetic, and it's attached to a host organism, which is the human body. Then everything depends on the effective biointegration between the prosthetic device and the host organism. Now, by analogy, our built environment is like a prosthetic device. It is artificial, it is synthetic, it is human-made. Then the question is, what is its equivalent host organism? The answer is very simple, it is the, it's the biosphere. And so then everything depends on the effective biointegration of our prosthetic device of our built environment with the biosphere. And so ecological design then is what is effective biointegration? And to me, there are two ways to biointegrate 
which is systemic and physical. And this to me is what green design is about. If we're able to integrate everything that we make and do, our buildings, our artifacts, our lifestyles, our production processes, with the natural environment, with the biosphere, in a seamless and benign way, then there won't be any um, environmental disruption. And so, what is this biointegration? And so I started to look at what the, started to look at fiscal biointegration and started to define it for myself. Fiscal biointegration is for me bringing two parts together in a physical way, almost mechanical. So I started to look at you know patterns in which this could be done. You can either put it in one location, as in uh, this diagram here, where you put all the vegetation, the biotic constituents and the abiotic constituents into the built environment, one location. Um, geographically, um, the top diagram shows New York and like Central Park is all in one location. An example is for this project that we did in Singapore, which is the National Library. And here we, we put all the vegetation in a series of sky courts with the nation in between. The second is a dispersed relationship where the vegetation is dispersed throughout the whole buildings as in the spotty relationship. And like in Georgian London where London Georgian London where you have Tavistock Square, you have Euston Square, Russell Square, Bedford Square. And so now by being this dispersed in this spotty relationship, certain species can move from one patch to another patch. But certain species cannot because they're not connected. And so this became the, the basis for our second project, where we put the vegetation on the outside of the building, where the series of sky courts with the terraces. And this was the building that we did back in 1986. Now, at the same time, we're looking into how we can design the skyscraper as a, as a low energy biochromatic building. And so um, we did studies on different ways of locating the elevator cores in the building. You can put it in the middle, as you can see, the top left corner, different orientation, you can put it to the sides. But studies show that putting it on the hot sides of the building, on the east sides and the west sides, um, reduces the energy consumption of the building. And so you can see on the diagram on the right hand side, you can see I put the, the you know in the gray area the cores on the east side and on the west side, and then we put vegetation on the outside. And this was the, uh, the building that was built back in 1986. Now, this was not satisfactory, um, even though it gave it, uh, you know, at that time it gave the building uh, an ecological aesthetic. And because I feel that an ecological building should not look pristine, it should look fuzzy, it should look indeterminate, and it should look hairy. And so the next one is the what I call the stepping stone relationship where the vegetation is not connected, the biotic constituents are not connected, but close enough to enable species from one part of the, one of the patch to move to the other patch. And so this was another building that we did around that time. You can see that between the two planters, I had a trellis, and so that the vegetation is brought up to the building, and you can see it brought up, you know, brought up halfway up the building, goes across the floor, and it goes up again on the other side of the building. But the ideal is this pattern in which the vegetation is connected, enables a species to move from one part of the site to, uh, of vegetation to the other part, enables species to interact, and species enable um, a larger sharing of a pool of resources between the species, for the species, and by having a larger pool of resources enable species migration, you have a much more higher level of biodiversity. By having a higher level of biodiversity, you have a much more stable ecosystem. So this is, if you like, the ideal pattern. And we should try and connect the vegetation again to the landscape and, and, and between each other. On the top right-hand corner, you can see the planning implication where we have a series of ecological corridors with fingers that go into the city. And so this was the ideal for me, and I started to look at designs you know, which were using this uh, pattern. And this was the scheme we did in uh, Singapore, where we brought the vegetation in a continuous ramp going all the way up the building, and that with each facade, I climb up one floor. And so this, the next is the concept drawing that we did, 
to show the walkway to service the planters and the planters climbing up on the facade. And it took us a few years to get this built, and here it is the eventual the scheme. You can see the people walking on the outside, the planters on the facade, and the sun shading on top of the building. And so this was the eventual building that we did. It took us about 10, 15 years to get this idea implemented. And here it is, it climbs all the way up to the top of the building. This is a rooftop garden. This is the middle of the garden. And this is looking at the building from the top. You can see the, the gardens at various levels. And you can see the, uh, the ramp uh, on, the, on the lower part of, of this diagram. Now, it's, uh, I started to call this a linear park because if you stretch this linear, uh, ramp out is about 1.3 kilometers and that rather than to have a, a, a monotonous linear park I punctuated the park with sky courts at the corners of the building so that what you have is a series of punctuated um, plazas, mini plazas in the sky so that people as they walk up can interact with the people inside the building. And so the idea then was to try and create habitats within the building. You know, the habitats could be on top of the building, could be on a green wall, could be on green terraces, could be inside the building. And I wanted to bring it all the way down to the basement, which I call an eco-cell. And so for this project, the vegetation continues in this ramp and spirals all the way down to the basement at the bottom of the building. And this was a scheme that we did a few, uh, about five, six years earlier. It's a master plan for the Carlin waterfront. Uh, we had a series where this, the, 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 we call this an eco cell because it provides opportunities for vertical integration into the basement, provide opportunities for rainwater harvesting, um, for natural ventilation in the past of the building for daylight, and at the bottom I could put a living machine or a bias rail. And so this was a scheme, it was a competition, we didn't win the competition, but this was our design for the Kowloon, Kowloon waterfront. Now, for this particular building, Solaris building, is basically two blocks. You can see one and two separate, separated by an atrium, but wrapped around by the same skin. And so, um, it's block A and B, and the two, um, you can see this atrium in between, but the space in between the two blocks is not air conditioned. To make it a low energy building, we just blew cold air into this space, and then on top of the building, we have operable louvers. Uh, that let the hot air out when it gets too hot and that in, when it rains it automatically shuts and so it becomes a sealed uh, atrium um, in, the, uh, in the inclement weather and so it's looking out from the bottom into the atrium. Then um, another experiment we did was to have what we call um, a diagonal light shaft and so cut through the floor we have a light shaft it goes from the street level all the way down to the top, or almost to the uppermost floor. And here's looking up. The idea was to bring light into the inside of the building and to bring light into some of the floor plates. And so the diagonal light shaft is just basically, it's an excellent experiment, just a small, you can see that rectangle there, and it goes all the way down. And this is a simulation of the um, lighting conditions. So it's, you know, the floor plate is fairly deep floor plate. It is, um, the lighting conditions are not perfect, but we wanted to optimize the plot ratio. And the building form was part of the master plan, which was designed by the famous architect Zaha Hadid. So she defined the floor plate and, uh, and defined the shape of the site. From there, we, we, we just optimized the, the built up area. And this is the, the light shaft looking from the bottom, from the street level, looking up to the top. So you can see the, uh, the louvered skylight you know, at the top of the building. And this is looking down from one of the floors into the street. Now, the two blocks are linked by bridges. And so here's one of the bridges that link the two blocks. And, and so that's the summary of this building that we finally did in about 2006. Now, at this stage, you think, all can does is put vegetation buildings. We can do that too. So this is what a lot of our competitors and friends do. And so I want to take it to the next level. And so we start to look at the next level of biointegration, which I call systemic biointegration. So systemic biointegration, we create habitats within the building. This habitat, as I mentioned earlier on, 
uh, green roofs, green gardens, green walls, and so forth. And this is a scheme that we've just been completed, where you can see the different habitats which are marked in red in the upper bar. And then um, at the same time, oh, this, this is the plan for the project, you can see the different habitats. And then within the habitats, we start to do species, do research on species we want to bring back into the building. So this is the building view from the front. Um, it was, this is a flyover during our Independence Day, and you can see the aircraft on top of the building. And then these are the sides of the building where I split the glass. It's actually a double glass. It's a double skin facade, and I'll show that in a minute. But what we do is that, first of all, we, we, we create the habitats within the development. Then we do research on the native fauna that we want to bring back into the site. Then from there, we do research on the native flora. We'll track the fauna, whether for feeding, for breeding, or for refuge, or for prey. And then um, we use this as a biodiversity matrix to design the landscape condition to enable the species to arrive to, to, to survive over the, over the, over the, um, over the, over, over the period of, over all the seasons of the year. And so this, if you like, is what we call the biodiversity approach in systemic integration of the external ecosystems with the built environment. This is the concourse in the middle of the building between the two blocks. It lies along, the building lies along the axis of the boulevard that leads to the Prime Minister's residence on top. And then um, that's the Prime Minister's residence. And then that's a secondary axis that goes to the waterfront. Uh, which is the Millennium Monument, which, we also, which was also designed by us about five, eight years earlier. And then the building actually is next to the very important bridge. And um, you can see the monument on the left-hand side and the boulevard right in front of the building leading to the Prime Minister's residence. The metaphor for the design for the building is a, is, is a jewel, is a gem. We want to facet it so that you know, this gives the building its own character and that the building actually is a double skin. So the, the outer skin is really a series of glass panels with fitted glass. Um, I wanted to experiment with the fitted glass panel as um, instead of using conventional sunshades. And so and the last image, that you, the second middle image is looking out from the inside of the building. And then from the, out, from the last uh, uh, image that you see here on the right hand side, is from the walkway between the outer skin and inner skin, looking into the outside, looking uh, looking at the panels. Um, on the west side, we shape it a little bit to get the western sun, and then the energy consumption for the building is energy efficiency index is 136 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum, uh, compared to 210, which is conventional um, office building um, that you you know that 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 has no sun shading or has not has no the use of glass, second skin. Now, next question is how do you locate habitats in a high rise? Because there's limited footprint. And so we start to look at the, um, the green areas and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the ecological areas around the site, um, surrounding the site and within the proximity of the site. And we started to create habitats again at the different parts of the building. And the next stage then is to design the habitats as specific zones uh, for, for dragonflies, for butterflies, for songbirds, and for migratory birds. So the habitats then attract birds and insects at different levels. So this was our biodiversity approach for the high rise, and this is a biodiversity diagram for this, uh, for this building. And so then my contention is, what happens if you design the building, not as a building with habitats, but design the building itself as a human-made ecosystem? Now that's an interesting proposition, so we start to explore how can we do this? And so to do this then, the whole building itself must have all the properties of ecosystem. So then I start to do research on what the properties of ecosystem, and that these are some of the attributes of ecosystems based on the work done by E.P. Oden on systems ecology, that the ecosystem, you know, the systems are integrated, biodiverse, 
as the biological structure of organic and inorganic constituents. It provides ecosystem services, it's connected, it's responsive to climate, um, it uh, produces pure water, it uses recycling materials, it has, um, it has, a, has a beneficial relationship within itself, a symbiotic relationship. Um, it's homeostatic because it responds uh, almost in, uh, homeostatically to, um, to uh, certain influences, it produces its own food, and it, it develops and matures over a process which ecologists call succession. Now, these are processes we have to imitate within our, our built environment to make them into ecosystems, to make our cities into ecosystems. And so this was also part, this became then part of my own agenda, and I haven't been able to go through all of these properties, and I started to go through them one by one, and that uh, biological structure I discussed earlier on, where we try and bring the uh, vegetation and the body constituents into, uh, with the building. This is another example of the combination in which, uh, in which um, I use a green wall that goes all the way up the building from one end of the site, goes across the wall on one side to the other side of the site, and then back again into the ground. And so it's not an ideal system, it was an experiment for me. And the, uh, the green wall actually is not the one that Patrick Prolonk used, uh, but it is a series of cassettes with a growing medium at the back. You can see the diagram. And that, you know, you can see in the image on the left hand side that the green wall is a series of cassettes. Um, it's not fully grown yet, so you can actually see the cassettes. But if the green wall, um, if the green wall, um, dies for that particular part of that wall, we can just take the set and replace it rather than rip off the whole wall. So that's the benefit of the system, but it's not an ideal system. The, ent the entrance of the lift lobby is naturally ventilated, and then we flip the roof a little bit um, to put photovoltaics um, to give some energy uh, to the building. The building uses about 150 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum, compared to 210 of a conventional office building. Now the next aspect that we should try and imitate to make our buildings in our buildings in our cities into constructed ecosystems is the provision of ecosystem services. Now what is ecosystem services? Ecosystem services are ecosystem ecosystem services are things that nature does without human intervention. And here is a whole list of things that nature does. In other words, the, from the, going from the top left column to the, to the right, it produces oxygen, it uh, maintains the biological and, and genetic biodiversity, and so forth. Now, this is a huge undertaking. It's extremely difficult for us to imitate this. And so, you know, when I talk to ecological designers who say, so, oh, I've done a super green building, they're only just scraping the bottom because Nature is so complex and so diverse that it's almost impossible for us to imitate this, 100%. So I mean, for instance, nature produces, uh, uh, you know, produces oxygen through photosynthesis. Now we can imitate. Recently, the University of Cambridge scientists have been able to artificially imitate photosynthesis, but it's only at a small scale. But can you imagine how can we do this at a scale large enough for the whole planet? And so we are touching only the bottom of the ice, the tip of the iceberg, in trying to imitate nature. So, so I mean, the arrogance of a lot of architects and engineers and scientists to say that we, the technology can solve all the environmental problems, is not really true because it is, nature is so big and so complex that we cannot do this. Another aspect is what I call um, the sequestering and detoxification of human and um, industrial waste. So what nature does is that it absorbs the waste uh, from our pollution production systems and treat them. And, and, but this waste has been so extensively produced now, and that whatever is produced in the past, we were not able to sequester it. It will likely to extend in the future. It will affect our future generations. And so saving the planet is no longer uh, a, a you know, preventive action. It is a race and rescue mission now. We only have a very short period of time to do this. And how many of us are involved in doing this? And there are a lot of pretentious architects. You go around, you know, go outside and talk to any architect, and you say, oh, we do green design. But you only 
doing green design at the green wash level, which is you know getting into the depth and into the, in, into the full ecological design, is something that you know, the whole community of architects you know have not even started. Now, my generation of architects were not brought up in ecology, and so to get our, my generation of architects to do green design in the ecological way is almost too late because many of them you know are already late in life. And many of them, you know, uh, are arrogant about what they do, and, and many of them think that um, they do green design just as good as anybody else. All they have done is just comply with the certification systems. And so now, what do we do? So uh, the answer to me then was that we cannot reinvent our human-built environment to imitate nature, but we can build our built environment and elicit the help of nature. So I call it augmenting our built environment with nature. And so one of the ways to do this is to bring nature as close to our built systems, both you know, in terms of planning layouts as possible. So this is an idea where nature goes through this a series of fingers, a that's a corridor, and then and, and it equals the fingers, and then, and then on the other hand, it would be the urban areas that weave into the two so that they come almost like a cross pan where nature is on one side and, and the built environment on the other. And so nature is much bigger in human environment. So the idea was to try and see whether we could create uh, our cities now as a series of corridors and fingers that link the two together. This is a scheme that we master plan that we did in the Reunion Island, um, which is um, off Madagascar, is near, um, you know, it's, it's south, southeast of India, southwest of India. And the idea was again to bring the vegetation into the built area and the built area weaving into the other. And so this is the master plan. You can see the fingers of built area going out and the vegetation along the waterfront being collected as a corridor and brought in those fingers into the uh, environment. Uh, for this scheme, it took about 30 meters between one and the other, and the equality of fingers are about 20 meters. So this is looking down into the waterfront. You can see the equality of fingers going down, and you can see the uh, fingers climbing up, and the built areas going down, weaving the two. So in this way, we're using nature to help us sequest our, our emissions and our, and our outputs and to bring the two together. And so one of the, one of the properties of ecos, uh, ecosystems is connectivity, because in nature, everything's connected. And so the idea then was to try and have ecological, you know, in this scheme, I have a series of roads that cut across the site and so what we try to do is to bring the, the, the ecological fingers underneath the road so that it's connected and going all the way into the top of the, uh, top of the site. And so you can see the road and cross and the ecological fingers. So you have two plots, A and B, which is separated by this highway. Then the, the, then the proposal is to have the ecological undercroft that goes from A and B. By linking A and B together you know, um, systemically, then um, what was too disparate Patches now becomes one single uh, patch which has a larger sharing of resources, so I mentioned earlier on, and higher level of biodiversity. Now, here's an example of making nature whole by reconnecting it. This is the master plan that we did in Bangalore uh, for the uh, Soma Klein. Um, there is a vegetation, a forest reserve on the, on, on the western side, and the, this view is from the no no northwest. And so uh, we collect all the species. And we brought these, the ecological fingers and corridors across the site. So this is a master plan. And you can see the, uh, the uh, ecological corridor. that we collect all the species on the forest reserve. And we brought it across the site, down to the other side. So this can connect to the adjoining sites and try and make nature whole again. Because what human beings is, we fragment the, um, the landscape. You know, you go on a piece of land, human beings will chop it up to little pieces. And separated by roads, by drains, by fences, and by imperm impermeable surfaces. And then this is the water recirculation system that we have uh, for the project. <clears throat> and what we found is the water starts to bifurcate the green areas. And so again, like the ecological undercroft, what we did then was to use um, ecological bridges that link the vegetation, and so that the vegetation is connected from part of the site the other part is connected across the site. And this was the ecological undercroft that we used earlier on. Now, hydrology is very important because water is what life is all about. You know, without water, we 
can survive. I mean, when astronomers look into the planets, the first thing you look at is, is there signs of water? If there's signs of water, then there's signs of organic life. And so what we try to do here is to try and close the loop within the building to reuse the water, recycle the water, and, and, and treat the gray water. And then outside the building, we bring it back into the ground, we charge the aquifers. And so th this is one of the things that we try and do, and these are different ways of doing it. And that, uh, so we should close the system as much as possible. But for the black water, we should try and treat it naturally if we can through a series of constructed wetlands. But not most times, you don't have the site big enough to do this. So you may have to share this with other people. So you might have to find some other non-mechanical means to do it. And so, then I thought, wait a minute, nature and buildings are not the only component. We have to look at our human society. But before we do this, we need to look at green design at a level of infrastructure. Now, let's say this is a city with an infrastructure of electrical grid or the, or the sewage or the water supply. What a lot of green architects are doing is just putting build, the, you know, the series of buildings the some are connected to the grid. Um, but this isn't really green design because um, the, if the grid, electricity from the grid comes from the burning of fossil fuels which pulls the air, then this makes total nonsense to design a green building. And so green building then has to start at the infrastructure level. So what happens if the infrastructure itself is green? If the energy comes from, from renewable sources, and water is, can be recycled and recirculated and sewage are naturally treated. Then it's much easier to make the city green or make the, a particular locality green than to just to do green buildings. And so if I were to leave an idea in your head, um, is that green design is not just designing green buildings, but designing green infrastructure as a whole, and that is what we should try and do. Now, at the moment, you talk to any planet today, they say, yes, we design with the green infrastructure and we design with the blue infrastructure. But there are two other components they have to consider, which is human society. Because our lifestyles and the, and the way we lead our lives and the things that we buy and that we make, you know, has to be green. And, and our social, economic, political, institutional system itself forms an infrastructure. And then, of course, there is the technology, the production systems, ag agricultural systems, which is I call, you know, which is the third component, which I call the built environment. So green design is how we can bring these four infrastructures together and bind integrated into a whole. And so this then is my next proposition to you, that when we look at a design, we should say not only should we bring the greenery into the, into the uh, built environment, which is the gray, I call it the gray because um, I just give it color coded, we also have to integrate not just the water systems, the hydrology, but also our human society systems. And so the idea of, of ecological design is really a massive undertaking because it requires changes not in the way that we design, because the way we design, then we have to look at things differently, but also it changes in the way that society works. Now that is a huge undertaking. Now who's going to do this? The only way to effect this is probably by political power. But you have to convince the powers that be that they have to change the whole community in order to know the whole um, system, the societal system, to make it into green, um, to make it in, in the green future. And so to get from here to, to a sustainable future is a long way to go. And, and weaving these together into a whole, that is a massive undertaking. Now this is the diagram where all the four structures are woven into a whole. Now it's much, it's easy to do this diagram but it's complex because where they intersect requires a lot of work. And so green design is a massive undertaking that we all have to do. Now, one of the things that nature does is that nature responds to climate. So different parts of the biosphere have different climatic zones and that the biomes, the habitats, the species for each of these biomes in different parts of the planet responds differently to the climate. So you have different species for different locality. So this is a lesson that we need to learn with our architecture, that we, our architecture has to respond to the climate to be, first of all, low energy and to imitate nature. And so this is a diagram I did to show how we can approach designing a low energy building. 
uh, almost like a net zero energy building, and that if the outside climate is that blue dotted line, then we go through a series of steps as we head towards the last uh, um, component, which is, uh, well, not the last component, the one before. But this diagram is to show that what engineers are doing, which is wrong. Engineers want to tell us that we have to have a consistent temperature, humidity, and air change throughout the whole year. That's why you can see this straight diagram, the straight line across it. But we don't have to be consistent throughout the whole year. We can be a little bit hot in the summer, a little bit cold in winter, and we should optimize the, the weather during the mid-seasons, which are the nicest part of the year. And so this is the approach where, first of all, we should try and optimize the bioclimatic approaches, optimize all the of how to make the building low energy without the use of any mechanical electrical system, without the use of any technology. And so on the right hand side are some examples by proper building orientation, by build, uh, proper building configuration, by facade design, and by optimizing, for instance, the ambient energy of the place. So that's the first thing you need to do when we design, when you respond to the climate, is to respond to it you know, in terms, in, in a passive way. The next then is to optimize the mix mode, which is using systems which have some technology, but not a, lot, not a lot of technology, then we try and optimize the renewable sources of energy before we go to the, you know, and then we try and use the, the, um, the most latest low energy efficient systems we have for the full tank, for the, for the full mode. And so here's an example of how we could design in relation to climate. What the other idea, the next idea then I had is that what happens if we design buildings like an umbrella? Now, those of you, you know, all of us have used umbrella, and umbrella is an incredibly bad cybernetic device because if the sun is one position, we orientate the umbrella to, you know, uh, to keep out the sun. If the winds one direction, we win, and the rain, and so forth, we automatically adjust it. Now, what happens if we design a building like an umbrella? Now, I haven't been able to do this, but it's like my golden challenge, something I want to do in our projects. And so, this is a, the idea was to have a canopy of umbrella of a building. Uh, this is a master plan for the uh, university, where I again have a glass canopy, glass umbrella over, uh, which has fitted glass with patterns on it. And this is the master plan for the whole uh, university. And this is another project where we had a different shape umbrella. Um, and this is the top view of the project. And um, this is the building that we designed. Um, with the, you know, with this is the modern version, the more recent version of the umbrella. There's a series of, of, of creations across the site. And then um, now I thought an early pro project I did back in 1985 is the umbrella, which is like a concrete louvre. So this was back in 1985. We had a concrete umbrella which lets in the morning sun, keeps out the midday sun and the afternoon sun. And so this was a small house in 1985. And you can see the louvres on top of the house angle to keep out the afternoon sun. The house ideally should be orientated north-south, but because of the sun conditions, it's not exactly north-south. You can see north, you know, it's about, you know, pointing to the uh, upper, the upper corner of the site. So we use a swimming pool as a cooling device so that it evaporates the, the, air, the, 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 the wind before it enters the house, and this is the plan of the house, and that, um, that's the main staircase going up to the top of the building, which is a spiral staircase, and that um, the house is cross-ventilated north, south, east, and west, and this is the corridor going up to the, uh, going to the west of the site, and that the floors, uh, the walls are, are shaped um, to blur the, the differences between the inside and the outside, so the diagonal, so that the inside and the outside are interconnected spatially, and that the building then becomes a series of courtyards A, B, C, and D, and E. Um, I know, so that the building is no longer like a single isolated castle within the plot, but the building is then integrated with the plot, just one single uh, complex. The energy efficiency index is about 42 kilo hours per square meter per annum, and the building lies outside in the in the woody areas. And here is the surrounding. Uh, landscape to the site, and where you see the little uh, black uh, white square, you can actually see wildlife, and there's the monkey bird, so within the whole location. And so this is the first thing we did, 
This house was designed based on the idea of optimizing the passive mode strategy. The next thing is mixed mode, which is the use of some technological system. So this is the building that we did. Uh, uh, though this is uh, in Beijing, and here this is the, this is the uh, umbrella over the building, and you can see the station underneath the building. That's the master plan of the station. That's the roof view of the station. Plan of the station. Then now for cold climate, this is a scheme that we did in UK, where the London is London is about 52 degrees above the equator. And so what we try to do, oh, so I'm sorry, this, I, I, this is another project we did near Beijing, where we use mixed mode. The idea of mixed mode is that if the mid season is a, is a pleasurable and cool season where we don't need to heat and air condition it, then what happens if we extend the mid season into the winter and into the summer? So by extending mid season, then we reduce the period for heating in summer and a period for heating in winter. So this was the idea of this project where we did in Beijing. It's a plot of land which is about 300 meters by 300 meters. And this is a master plan for the site where we brought the eco-infrastructure, you can see the red and right-hand side, on the existing site, on the existing buildings. And then the main building is this one. And with this main building, we put a series of flues, we cut a series of voids underneath to bring the, the air into the, into the inside of the building. And that we simulated the flues so that the flue then, you know, as you can see, the blue diagram shows the voice we cut into the building and it sucks up the air during the mid-season to cool the building during an autumn and over the summer, and so that it uh, reduces the need for heating and ventilation over summer. Then we had resistance from the client in putting vegetation buildings. The client says, I don't want any vegetation buildings. And so we had to find a solution for that. And the solution then was to use a, a tile which then treats the pollution in the air and converts it into a salt. And so this, the idea was to retile the building so that you know, the building then becomes itself a pollution absorbing device. Then for this project in London, which is about 52 degrees above the equator, instead of putting the flues in the middle of the building, we put it on the outside of the building uh, as part of the curtain wall. The idea was then was that it sucks up the air in the mid-season through the buoyancy of the temperature between the outside and the inside. And the lower three floors, which is the, uh, the cafe, uh, which is operated by Walt Disney, would then would have natural ventilation and be low energy during the mid-season. So the top would be a valve, which then lets the air out, and the bottom would be another valve that sucks the air in. This is the building, and that's the building itself uh, in Great Ormond Street in the Bloomsbury area in London. And uh, this was finished back in 2010. But the ideal condition is where the whole building itself becomes a power station. The whole building absorbs the energy from, from renewable sources. And so this was an experiment, a design that we did for a possible tower, where you can see very inclined walls, you know, it's basically two floors, and we use embedded photovoltaics in the glass, and so the whole building itself becomes, uh, you know, um, um, a power station. Now, to make this effective, um, only limitations to how high you can build a building, because our engineers tell us for this to be 100% self-sufficient renewable, 42% of the surface of the area need to be covered by photovoltaics. And so that is the challenge we need to do in designing renewable energy. So to summarize, this, if you like, is our diagram for designing low energy buildings heading towards a net zero energy building. Now, I'm going to ask you to bear with me a little bit because I'm going to talk about the theory of ecological design because ecological design is not just as simple as people say it is. Now, in general systems theory, it's based on the premise that there's a system, the system environment. The relationship between the system and environment is that the system takes an input from the environment and gives an output to the environment. So this is, if you like, this is what general systems theory is about. So we, if we translate this into, into our into our present condition. Then the, the environment is the biosphere, which is not just the ecosystems, it includes the bio, uh, jo, uh, jo, you know, bio, biospheric cycles, inputs is energy, materials, people, food, and outputs are you know, the same as waste energy, waste materials, and so forth. What we need to do then is to close the loop as much as we can, to try and 
bring the outputs back into the built system so that it becomes, in, like in nature, like the ecosystem, a complete self-sustaining system. So good nature, waste actually is a, is a human definition, is a human creation, because nature has no waste. And that um, the waste from one organism is, becomes food for another. So we should try and learn from nature and close the loop as much as we can. And so we should try and preserve and conserve the biosphere to try and reduce and, 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 and use renewable uh, materials and, and energy for inputs. We should try and optimize the efficiency of the, of the, of the way we use the environment and we should close the loop as much as possible. As much as possible. And so in principle, this is, if you like, the general propositions that need to be redesigned. Now, what happens if I use the symbol one? You can see the symbol one there to represent the biosphere with the environment. What happens if I use a symbol two to represent the built environment? The input then will be from one to two, which is one to two, which is inputs, and outputs will be from the built environment to the biosphere, which is two to one. Now, in principle, we have to know in, exactly in totality what happens in the environment, know totality what we're doing within the building, in the totality the inputs we're taking from the environment and the inputs we're emitting. Emitted. And so if the symbol L represents the totality, then ecological design means we have to be uh, uh, we have to be aware of the totality of everything that takes place in the environment and we need to monitor it and to, to, to have sensors. At the moment we you know we haven't even started doing this, but we have started but, but in a very small scale. And we know to, you know they have to know L22, which is everything that takes place within the built environment. And we don't know because you know what one person's doing, the other person doesn't know. And then we know, need to know all the inputs into the environment and all the outputs. And so if you like, if you put all this together, this is what mathematicians call the partition matrix, because ecological design is the, is the interaction of all these four components seen at the same time. Now, this is an incredibly complex process. We don't even have the quantification to do this. I'm not sure whether we have the computer system to do this. But this is the ultimate ch golden chalice of what we should be doing you know, for the whole planet. Monitor the environment, monitor the built environment, monitor the inputs, monitor the outputs, and make sure that all these interact in a seamless and benign way. Now that is what we should be doing in ecological design. And so that is, for me, the theory of ecological design, which we haven't even started doing. Now, then I'm going to end in a minute because at the end of ecology, at the end of it, at the end of this whole idea of ecological design, it's us as human beings. Because we are the cause of all this. If we can control ourselves, control what we do, then there won't be any environmental disruption at all. Because we as human beings have ideology towards nature. We should not see nature as, as, a, as a, ourselves as a dominant species and nations be exploited and utilized. But we should, as, as, uh, we should see ourselves as stewards, as protecting and conserving nature. Our ideology then determines our social, economic, political, inf and institutional system, and how the country is run. You know, this determines what is society. The election determines the party that decides what are social, economic, political systems. Then it is the social, economic, political, and institutional systems that determines the physical systems that we make, how we plan our cities, how we plan our transportation, what sort of buildings to be built, and that these are then have the impact on nature. So everything depends on us as human beings. We have to change, our lifestyles have to change, our diets have to change, our lifestyles have to change, the things that we want you know, should change. We should not just have one more and more of things, but just have basic minimal things. We have to relook in the whole idea of of what economic growth is all about. That's why people talk about the psychic economy to try and do this. And so I'm going to end now. These are some of the ideas I presented today. The idea that architecture, ecological design is physically effective integration. That physical integration is the different ways of bringing components together, of the biotic and apatic constituents together. We should try and imitate ecosystems and attributes. Not just imitate, you're trying to replicate them as much as possible. And one of the you know, significant attributes we need to try and replicate uh, is to ecosystem uh, services. And we can should only do this by augmenting nature, by augmenting our built environment with nature. And that ecological design is a biointegration 
of nature, with water, with our human society, with technology. And so this is a diagram of what the ecosystem is like to be. And that we should start designing infrastructures rather than just building. And that we should look into different ways we can articulate and design a building. And that the umbrella is a, is, a, is a wonderful metaphor for designing a building. And this is, if you like, a theoretical model of what we need to consider in ecosystem design. And as I mentioned earlier on, everything depends on you and I as human beings that we have to change our lifestyles, our diet, our way of lives, our mobility, our, our desires for to have more and more things. So everything then starts with us. <laughs>